So for that, that was very. This alpha tends to to one, so I should not. Which way should I go? Should I go? Is it better here? No. Okay. Okay. So I will. Sorry. But let me know if something is wrong. So then I can unclip yeah. this. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um. Yeah. So if alpha tends to one, then the kernel degenerates to the constant because also uh, the gamma function, which is here in the denominator, uh, degenerates. There's quite a fair amount of recent textbooks. Here's just a small selection, and you see many of them all appeared within the last five years. And what is the analytical challenge? Well, all these standard rules of um, a differentiation and integration do not apply anymore. We have no product rule, as you know, we have no chain rule, not in the standard way. So if you have a product of two functions and you want to take the fractional derivative, it is not just simply the sum of one fractional derivative applied to one function times the other one plus the other term. No, that all this does not help. And you might say, well, I don't need this. It's perhaps not so important. But then if you look carefully in your proofs, you realize, well, no proof without implicitly using these rules which for us is like one plus one equal two, and you even do not think about it that you're using these rules, but they are there in the proofs about, for example, existence results. From the computational, the challenge is that because of this, because of this convolution, you have an additional integral from zero to t in there, and this means you have a global history dependency. And if you think about your ODE numerical analysis class one, you realize there are the one-step methods, but there are the multi-step methods. But the good news for multi-step method is that you can work, for example, with two, three, or four time steps back. But now suddenly you need all of them. You have the knowledge, you need the knowledge up to the starting point. And that, of course, makes things from a numerical point of view more challenging. Now I have somehow lost. Ah, I need to be. Okay. So here, just for you as an overview, I'm not the author of any of these textbooks, so don't try to find my name here. I just wanted to show you uh, that there's a huge variety here. It ranges from applications in mechanics, as for example here, but also uh, wave equations. Um, it is more the numerical methods, it's parabolic equations, it's the analysis. Again, it is uh, numerics, it is uh, fractional uh, numerical methods, and of course, it's also part in modeling, mathematical modeling for biomechanical problems and so on and on. So 
let's go a little bit back to these uh, challenges. I think I'm also losing to the, the headline of the slides. Uh, there should be headlines. Yeah. So um, what is the idea behind it? The idea of some numerical solution techniques behind is that we go with the Leibniz formula, which is basically the inverse operator of the fractional operator. So instead of considering the fractional differential equation, you consider the fractional integral equation. And this tells you that we have to convolute basically in the different order. And uh, that formula holds even for fractional derivatives. And now you see that you can easily write down from a formal point of view, u of t is the initial conditions plus this time integral from zero to t. And of course, uh, the more advanced you are in the time interval, the more difficult is the numerical treatment of this integral. And again, you see a typical convolution. So at the end of the day, you see that you have these, how to prove this, you, you plug in the definition here, which is another convolution, and then um, you get to this, and because of this convoluted with this, you end up here. So that is um, kind of good news. Now the bad news comes because of this, is this uh, t to the power function with this negative exponent, you, you cannot really integrate this analytically. But what you can is, you can try to approximate that kernel by a sum of exponentials. Let us assume for the moment that someone gives us these weights and these modes. Then, if we have such an approximation, and you plug in now the approximation for the G in the formula above, well, then you get to this result here. We have nothing done but plug it in, that approximation for G alpha, which I have noted down here, in here, and I'm ending up with here. Now, what do I do in the next step? Well, I define everything which is written from here to here as a new function, u tilde. And for each term in the sum, I have a u tilde k. Hmm. But then, if this is u tilde k, which is written here, you realize that this u tilde k satisfies a very simple integer order differential equation. Don't get fooled with this term here because this is the u, and for the u, that is given by the right-hand side of our problem. So here we have now a perfect, simple, first-order, linear, differential equation for UK tilde. And that every one of you knows how to solve. Explicit Euler, the implicit Euler, some fancy method. Everyone knows how to solve such an equation. Well, then why can I not stop? Why do I have still 40 uh, pages here to move on? Mm -hmm. Well, if the original problem was nonlinear, the right-hand side of my original problem depends on you. So what is written here possibly depends on you. And without knowing you, I cannot solve this because then I don't have the right-hand side of this equation. So I have to, to couple it back to the U. And this is exactly what is done in, in some of the next steps. I'm always a little... Uh, ah, Maybe this should be yeah, clicking here. Let's see. Okay. okay. So now I'm coming to this uh, numerical approximation. Are you cheat? Am I cheating now with what I told you before? Where's the problem? I mean, I have explained to you some ideas, and the idea was I approximate the kernel, then I get to this very simple system for the u tilde. Okay, from the u tilde, I have to recompute uh, somehow the u, but let's go back to the same formula. Can you now code it? What is missing for you to code it? I can go back to the slide. So you see, if I have the utility, I can compute the U. If I can compute the U, I can compute here my right-hand side and can solve it. 
Of course, I can explicit, implicit, I have to question this myself, but perhaps I iterate or do things like this. But what is your problem now if I ask you to code it? What is your problem? Is everyone happy in coding this? I did not tell you any, I didn't give you any information about the lambda and the omega. I have been just assuming. Let's assume that we have a good approximation by this. But how do you pick it? Well, and, and here, there are of course many different options. What we do is we pick, and how do I fix the number of nodes? I mean, I was saying K runs from one to whatever. In theory, up to infinity, but in reality, hopefully to a small number. And uh, this is basically here, what you see here, it's an accuracy over the number of modes, M in total, up to 25, 24 modes, and in depending of different alphas. And the higher the number of modes, is, the higher the accuracy is. And in this logarithmic plot, semi-logarithmic plot, it's more or less on a linear line. So, how to get um, the, the, the lambdas and the, the weights? This is a part of this slide here. And uh, here the idea is, first we apply a Laplace transform of the kernel. So the Laplace transform of the kernel is something very simple. It's just one to the power of that to the power of alpha. And if I do it for my approximation, I find out of the sum of exponentials, I find that formula. So this and this part is the exact Laplace transformation of the original kernel and its approximation. Now, um, still the question remains, how do I get the omegas and the lambdas? And this is now the, the idea to apply a rational approximation. And with this rational approximation um, that has this very simple form, polynomial divided by a polynomial. And if I want to apply it to the approximation of z to the power of alpha, which is the inverse, basically, what I have here, I get the coefficients. I can rewrite it. And I realize that if I plug in z to the power of minus alpha here, I do get back this. And for this rational approximation, we resort to what is known in the literature, and it's in this kind of by now five-year-old paper. And uh, some of uh, you might know one of the co-authors in this paper better. It's Nick Trefferson, and it's the so-called triple A algorithm. How to compute uh, the coefficients and modes in a rational approximation for a very generic function, and here we apply it to the special function z to the power of alpha. What is important is, and that is important for the stability of the algorithm, that we are getting non-negative modes and uh, weights. And therefore, the Bernstein theorem guarantees us that our kernel approximation is completely monotone. And that is very important for the stability of the numerical algorithm. We do not have a proof for it that as a rational approximation algorithm does give us these things, but it's easy to compute or to control numerically. I mean, you just look at what you get, and in all our cases, it was uh, granted. Now you can go for this rational approximation, and then you can even look at the uh, hours, um, what your rational approximation gives you, and you can look at how modes and uh, lambdas, weights and lambdas are distributed for different alphas. Having now the information about the weights and the modes, you can go back to your original problem that you want to solve a fractional uh, ODE or even PDE, and then yeah, I told you before, well, the U tilde depends implicitly on the U. The U depends implicit on the U tilde. Well, we might go with explicit implicit. Uh, this this might be not clear to you. Is this really a coupled problem? Is it decoupled? What does it really ask? But then, and this is the amazing news is, let us assume the original problem was a nonlinear, even PDE problem then the problem for all these 
mode equation. So the problem for all these U tilde K are completely decoupled. First good news for doing numerics, because this means you can vectorize it. Secondly, they are always linear. Even if the original problem is nonlinear, they are linear. Thirdly, there's even of the original problem it was a PDE operator involved, it's not for the mode equations. So you just crash it through. You have no inverse. It is just a decoupled ODE system pass through. It's perfect for parallelization. It's perfect with respect to memory consumption. It's nothing. And why does it come from? Because you can take the update. Oh, sorry, that was the wrong button. You can take the update. So the UN plus one, that can be computed first. And also you see here directly the U tilde N plus one. But, and this is a big but, it can be the update in UN plus one can be computed without the explicit knowledge of the UK till the N plus one. That formula, of course, doesn't show it, but here it is the formula who shows it. And you see here, you need the UK till the N from the previous time step, and you need the updates here in UN and UN plus one, but there's no UK till the N plus one in here. And this is, of course, the abstract right-hand side of your original problem. And if this was a originally a nonlinear PDE, well, you have to face all the problems of the nonlinear PDE, of course. I mean, there's no free lunch in life, but there's nothing problematic in this type of equation. So it's the same complexity if you would go for an integer order type of uh, equation with the same PDE in space behind. And once you have the uh, update, sorry, that was the update equation for the UK uh, till the n plus one, but then you plug it in and that is the update here. So that is what you solved first. So don't be irritated. That is the equation you solve first. You see there's no UK till the n there. You solve this equation first. And then you go back to this equation and solve this, and you see all this can be done in parallel. And this is now linear because the new one you're looking for is only here. That's what that is. Well, here you see some numerical results. You have an implicit Euler. You have an um, Crank Nicholson with theta equal a half, which does not give you second order. Be careful. It only gives you order h or delta t to the power of one plus alpha. So if you're back, if alpha equal one is the integer order case, then you're back to second order, otherwise you're reduced. But also the regularity of the solution is typically reduced. Well, um, Crank Nicholson has some issues. In particular, the smaller the alpha is, what you see here is something you don't like to see. It is high oscillations at the beginning, which are damped out over time but they are there. Well, what can you do? Well, you can rethink a little bit uh, what the form of your utility is, and then you realize, oh, I can rewrite here parentheses are uh, missing that exponential covers these uh, three terms here, minus lambda k delta t. So that's in the argument of the exponential. Here as well, all this is in the argument of the exponential. You see that you can write it, as an integral from Tn, Tn plus one, and then you have a kind of exponential weight function here, and then you have the, the part you have really actually to integrate. And here you can go to an exponential integrator. You build this knowledge about this exponential in, you approximate this in a linear with a linear function at Tn and Tn plus one, and then you integrate that term exactly. And this gives you a new integration scheme, which is of exponential integrator type, which is well known, this technique in the literatures. And then you get a little bit of different formula. The weights are nasty, but easy to, to write down. And uh, then you can even uh, do some splitting with your F and explicit implicit part, depending on the PDE. So you can do 
convex concave splittings of this operator F to get it more robust in case of, for example, a Count Hilliard equation, uh, which is a nonlinear PDE by itself, you prefer to have a convex concave splitting for the nonlinear term. And this is you can combine this in, but that is a trick which has nothing to do with the fractional part. It's just a combination of two trips. And then this gives you an implicit explicit um, type scheme. And under these are, um, assumptions that the kernel approximation is small enough, meaning that the number of nodes is high enough, you get this order and that can be proven under, of course, always suitable regularity assumptions. Yeah, just uh, to go to um, a little bit more challenging example, it will be a nonlinear Kahn-Hilliard problem. You have uh, basically here the typical fourth order structure of Kahn-Hilliard, because if you think about the potential, look at the equation of the potential, it has a second order in the concentration here. And if you plug, would plug this back in, you see the, the fourth order, this is already in the weak form written. So if you go back uh, by uh, partial differential, uh, partial integration, uh, then you see really that you have here a second order PDE, you have another second order. So it's in total. Fourth order, the, you have this nonlinear part here, and you do this splitting, this convex concave splitting of that nonlinear part. And then this gives you the algorithm for updating un plus one and the potential. And knowing the updates here, you go back to your mode equations. And again, if you look at your mode equations, yeah, it's linear and decoupled. And that is the good news because this makes the, the coding of the mode equations very, very efficient. Uh, this IMAX scheme, uh, this is in combination with the exponential integrator that solves, resolves the issue about the oscillations here. So you go from here to here. So the oscillations are gone. And yeah, you just see here the energy decay of the Kahn Hilliard. So the Ginsburg Lando energy decays. And then you see also here an error decay with respect to delta t. Uh, that's perhaps not of the biggest surprise. Um, you can also go to other mathematical models. Here, there's a tumor growth model where uh, you have the tumor concentrations, the volume fraction of the tumor. You have a displacement field, so it's coupled with elasticity. Um, it has on top the subdiffusion effect, which is modeled by uh, the fractional operator. So you see it here again. Uh, and then, um, yeah, you get to this equation because if uh, the deformation equation is, uh, and this coefficient here is constant, then you can recover a little bit and do static condensation. You can also enrich it with chemotherapy effects or nutrient supplies and add a standard simple uh, reaction diffusion type equations of second order. And that is joint work with Laura Scarabosio. Uh, who has now a professor position in at Redbird University and some colleagues from the biomechanical department uh, at HITTUM. Um, so what I did not mention is, of course, this question. In general, we always try to teach our students, don't do numerics if you do not know that the problem you consider is sort of well posed or uh, you know that there exists a solution at least. So what are we doing here? Uh, the question, of course, is about the solution of these problems. And then you realize that the theory is much, much more challenging. If you go to a time-dependent PDE of nonlinear character, what do you know about the solution theory? Well, most of you might remember that with ODEs, the lemma of Cronwell, in, there are many different versions. But at the end of the day, the lemma of Cronwell plays a central role. Without it, you can't go. And uh, that holds true here as well. Unfortunately, again, we need a more generalized uh, version. And uh, that is basically the starting point. And you see what is the difference compared to a standard uh, Cronwell version. Well, the difference is that you have the convolution in here as well the upper bound. And then you get a nasty um, upper bound um, 
even if you look at this bound, you might not recognize everything. Well, gamma is the gamma function here. Uh, do you have any idea what it is? It's not on the slides. I did not define it. What function will it be? What function has two, possibly two parameters in there? Well, it's a Metatlefler function, what we have here. It's a nasty function, but at least we have formally an upper bound. And I already mentioned we have a kind of an absence of the chain rule. So we have here, unfortunately, no equal sign. But we have a larger equal sign. And very often, that is good enough to have a larger equal sign for upper bounds in the energy. Because at the end of the day, to get existence results, we need to have an upper bound in the energy. And that is the good news that at least we have. And then you, you proceed uh, in a typical way. You show weak strong convergence as a subsequence. Then you show that the limit satisfies a variational form. And you use uh, all these different uh, parts in the groups. So um, gradient flow. Anyone who has seen a gradient flow problem with an integer order will say, well, that question is easy to answer because the gradient flow problem is known to be dissipative. So the energy decays over time and strictly, well, not strictly in the sense, uh, monotonically in the sense that for all, it's not only this, but uh, that we have really this. This is what I meant. So for fractional gradient flows, that is not known. What is known is that we have this, but not this. And what you can do to compensate is you can show that the fractional order gradient flow problem is equivalent to an integer order gradient flow problem if you go to a higher dimension. And that allows you to get new ideas to have more sophisticated numerical integration scheme, but the price you pay is then you go to a higher dimension. So instead of being in time plus possible space, you're now in time plus space plus this auxiliary variable uh, which runs between zero and one. That's the price you pay. But with this, you can do a lot. I'm not going into this because I'm running out of time. I just want to skip. Uh, all this part and it gives you a little bit of just brief glimpse into applications. So you can go viscoelasticity. So all these modern uh, materials. So if you are in an airplane nowadays, sometimes you get a pillow, which is a memory foam pillow. You press in, you release, you go to the toilet. When you come back, it has still a little bit the foam of your neck, of your shoulder, of your head, of whatever. So these memory effects can be modeled mathematically by fractional um, operators or more generally by convolutions. Here again, uh, there are many different ways to do it. You can have a constitutive relation between stress and strain and on both sides you have a fractional component. You can also go for a very popular model, the so-called fractional signal wave equation for viscoelasticity in 1D. It has, of course, a second order standard derivatives uh, for the displacement. You see the wave equation if you forget these first terms. So if the tau are equal to zero, then uh, you see a, a wave equation character. Um, and then uh, with these tau terms, you have basically the difference uh, which is in there. Uh, you can see that not all possible selections of the parameters are possible. The ratio between what is in front of strain and stress has to be larger than one. Otherwise, you have stability issues. You see. Um, this typical damping effect of the wave front, the smaller this ratio is, but the larger this ratio is, in particular if it's over one, you have the increase of the wave propagation. So otherwise it's damped, have the viscous effect in there in your mathematical model. 
um, you can then go to an optimization problem in the sense that you have data, that you have, for example, um, elastic bar clamped on one side, you uh, pull it down, you release it, it starts to vibrate, you have tip displacement measurements, and you want to calibrate for the kernel because you don't want to know what alpha is. You, you know the stiffness, you know the elasticity module, but you don't know what alpha is. So you go to an inverse problem, and that is joint work with uh, Barbara Kaltenbacher uh, from the University in Klagenfurt, and also um, Vanya Nikolic, uh, also from Radboud uh, University in Mabel. And uh, here you do all these things, what people know about PDE uh, constraint optimization. And uh, then you can, you see, you can recover basically the kernel. You have the tip displacement. You have the tip displacement only measured within some small time uh, frame. And then you go even longer. And of course, this is a synthetic example in the sense that we generate our data ourselves, then we denoise it, and uh, then we try to recover the true kernel. Um, that was this first example I wanted to show. A second application is uh, dilute uh, polymeric fluids. And they are, of course, very much idealized because the polymer beds do not interact with each other. So that's a dilute. Um, and you have trapping effects. And this is joint work with André Sury from the University of Oxford, but also with Marvin, whom I mentioned at the beginning, but who is now a postdoc in uh, Linz. And what you have here, on one hand, you have the so-called Fokker-Planck equation, but in a fractional form. And um, you see the U here. What is the U? Well, U is the fluid. So you have a coupled system of PDEs, a Fokker-Planck equation, and the Fokker-Planck equation has the bad news that instead of a time-space domain, it acts on a time, space, and configuration space. So if you are in a two-dimensional physical space, the Fokker-Planck has a four-dimensional space. If it's a 3D, your physical space, it is 6D. Well, everyone who has solved uh, PDE by some typical finite element methods in 2D on a laptop, spatial domain, and goes to 3D, there's this realization, oops, it takes much longer. Now imagine you do not only go from 2D to 3D, but you go in the extreme case from 2D to 6D. It hits you. It really hits you with respect to runtime, even if the coding, also the coding is a mess, but with respect to runtime and memory consumption, it really hits you. Um, the good news is we are not really interested in the solution of the Fokker-Planck equation. That is for us only a help to get to the solution of the Navier-Stokes equation because the Fokker-Planck couples into the Navier-Stokes. So, we replay the same thing. I mean, it's fractional. We play mode approximations, and we, we even go with a splitting scheme of strength type, which is known in the literature. I'm not going into details. Uh, the Fokker-Planck part uh, comes to a system for this configuration space for this extra space, which gives you a typical structure. Things are coupling, but but what do you realize? when we are here, and we are here on this term, this blue star. And in this bold circle, everything is plotted, which couples to this blue star coefficient. What do you realize? Or this is another coefficient we are looking at. That equation with this coefficient couples with all the other green stores. What do you realize from this picture, which is a 2D picture where the basis functions for the configuration spaced or in a tensorial product structured? Well, you realize the green ones do not couple with the blue ones and the blue ones do not couple with the green ones. This means your matrix separates 
in a two times two block structure, even odd. And the good news is there's no coupling in between. You might observe something else, which is perhaps a little bit tricky to, to catch from here. That is what the index we considered. It couples with, with this, with this, with itself, with this, with this, with this, but it does not couple with this line here. And this is even better news, because what does this mean if you think of your typical stiffness matrix to bring it to some point on the computer? Well, it's a lower diagonal. It's a lower, no, it's a lower, what do you have to say? It's a matrix of that structure. Triangle. Lower, lower triangle matrix. So you can f solve it by a forward substitution. And you even do not need the higher modes. And that is basically the free lunch. And in 3D, it's the same. I mean, it's the same if you ask a student to code it, it will tell or she will tell you, oh, but come on. For one, I need one week. For the other one, I need one year or so. But fundamentally, from the abstract point of level, from the teacher's perspective, it is the same. It decouples even odd, and you have this nice structure. And to make things even better, so here we just see the influence of the alpha. And what is good news is you really see this different thing of subdiffusion. So you see, four, that is over time. You start with the same initial conditions. On the left, you see alpha equal 0 0.2, and on the right, you see alpha. 0.8. For small time, the alpha 0.8 drags behind. So it's slower. The smaller alpha rushes ahead. Then that one catches up. And from there on, the other one is faster. So it changes its role. First, it drags behind. And now it is faster to reach the stationary limit. It is like if two people run a, mar a marathon and they have a completely different strategy. One starts fast, the other one starts slow. But after 20 kilometers, they are changing strategy. The one has already saved energy and can, for the last 20 kilometers, runs full speed. The other one is already exhausted and <sighs> has to slow down and considerably slow down and reaches the stationary limit, so the 40 miles, only very, very much later. This is a little bit how you can interpret these results. And of course, now the last good news is uh, it couples to the Navier-Stokes equation, and the coupling comes in here, and this Cromer's expression is an integral. And for Computing this integral, we do not need the complete solution. We only need the first expression because this integral is for most i and j parents just zero. So we only need the first ones. And that is the final result. Basically, we only need these ones. And therefore, the complexity from intuitive four-dimensional problem is basically reduced to a three component two-dimensional problem. So we are back in what we can uh, solve. Well, that's just an example. Well, I'm out of uh, time, so I stop here. You can also apply all these techniques to generate randomly, uh, to generate random fields very nicely with fractional PDU operators. So you're just different random fields. What can you do with random fields? Go to a huge range of applications. You can uh, generate crack materials. You can generate multigrain materials. You can generate fiber structured materials, whatever you have in mind. You can go lattice materials like in additive manufacturing. You can go to this, uh, uh, I never can pronounce this, uh, gyroid materials and so on. All this is at the end of the day, just a fractional Laplace operator what you have to solve this on the right hand side you have a Gaussian white noise. Um, all these are examples of the same techniques and you can go to this application of the optimization of tall buildings under the random inflows of wind 
turbulence, wind fluctuations. You have several parts of randomness. You have data on one hand side with the wind rose data where you already see fluctuation in there. You try to resolve it with a copula model. And then on top of all this, you have the local random fluctuation, which is generated by a fractional model. And here it's not fractional with respect to time, but it's fractional with respect to the typical Laplace operator in space. So, but the solver technique, bringing it down to rational approximation and solving a small number of steps is exactly the same. Yeah, and with this, uh, I want to give you some uh, literature of what we have been doing here. And with this, I want to end and say just that these non-local operators, they play a more and more important role in the mathematical modeling. And if you look closer, they occur in so many different fields these days, from material modeling to biomedical uh, applications in time and in space. And with these techniques to bring it down by rational approximations of these operator, you can, first of all, there's a lot of room for numerical analysis, for designing new numerical schemes, and for getting efficient schemes in there, such that one has not to fear this non-locality any longer. So that's it, and uh, sorry for the a little bit longer talk. Thanks, Barbara, for the very, very interesting talk. Uh, I, I do have a very naive question, uh, so maybe you discuss it, but uh, at the very beginning of the talk, when you presented the expansions, uh, you you uh, ask a number of questions and one of them was uh, how do i choose the number of terms so where i cut off but, uh how do you choose the, <laughs> the cut off <laughs> um we do it very naively we uh, just experienced we looked at this approximation uh, let me see more or less about here and we realized that the approximation error is that with 20, we are on the safe side. So, okay. but in practice, we use a fixed number for all these applications, never more than 15. Okay. We had this idea, let's say, oh, we make it adaptively. Mm -hmm. But to be very honest, from a mathematical point of view, it's a nice thing because at the end of the day, if you do the full error analysis, you have three components. You have your temporal error in there, you have your uh, spatial error in there, and you have the modeling error by this M. And of course, you can say, I want to optimize it, that mm -hmm. cost balance error is at the optimum. That is nice. And from a mathematical point of view, I completely agree. And that was also, wow, we will do this next. But then you come to this problem that in front of all these error terms, they are constants you don't have under control. And because the main cost is in the update of the original problem, because this is a nonlinear PDE problem, there in this step, the update of the UN plus one, this is the main cost. The update of these nodes, if they are perfectly vectorized on a computer, it does not really make a difference if I have 10 or 15. I do not even have to solve a nonlinear problem. They are perfectly parallelized. They do not com commute with each other. And even with the scalar product, you say, oh, but there's a mass matrix. Yeah, but we update in M times U tilde. So even the mass matrix has not to be solved. So it is really, just a big vector, which is updated by a matrix vector multiplication, but that's it. And this is so cheap compared to the rest that this compute time 
it does not. So we had been also, for example, we had been also talking with Dietrich Braz, who is an expert in approximation theory here, who was saying, yeah, but if you do not take the rational approximation, if you do take some other approximation, you might save one or two nodes. Yes, might be. But I don't think it's worth the effort. I mean, it's a nice mathematical problem to go for this optimization. Yeah, you have these three error components and then you ask. But I don't think that it's feasible to really optimize for it because the constants don't have access. And on top, it's very difficult to change the number of modes within the process. So it's not that you can say, oh, I start with 20 and later on I go to 10. That is difficult. So. But your experience is that uh, you take like 20. It were, I mean, in all the applications, yeah. you, you went never... through it enough not to yeah. spoil the, because yeah. of course the point is, I mean, the other way around. You, I, I know. You want I mean, to choose the, I mean. You choose a number which at the end spoils the in the, the picture norm. You do not. We did not see a difference okay. between twelve and and twenty anymore. Okay. Of course, if you look at rounding error accuracy, there's a difference. But to be very honest, in many engineering applications, that's not the accuracy you aim for. Asymptotically, I completely agree. We cannot work with a fixed M because at some point that error will dominate. Thank you. Which type of relation there may be between the, the number of modes of a certain accuracy and the exponent of the. Of so the it's a log uh, um, a result. So the number of uh, required modes grows logarithmically with the accuracy. But the constant in front of, it's not really known, but numerically it seems to be that this constant is very moderate. And the log growth is of course a small growth. Well, thanks for the very interesting and comprehensive talk. Uh, I have a question on the um on the crank Nicholson part of the issue, the issue mm -hmm. that the crank Nicholson uh, has this oscillation. And the question is that uh, is it specifically for the crank Nicholson scheme or do you observe it uh, in general with the theta method? I mean, it's uh, the one alpha that is in between explicit and implicit or it, it is a uh, general? It is not. If you go really to the Euler, which is in the standard case, of course, fully A stable and all this, then you have no oscillation. Uh, if you go to smaller theta, so even direction of uh, explicit Euler, these oscillations are even more pronounced. But um, it's not that Crank Nicholson is the only one. Okay. But uh, we picked that one because it has a higher order than the other ones. And here, really, um, the take home message is. Do as much as you can analytically. And because this, what you see here, this is not an approximation. This is an equal sign for the mode equation. And now, where now the, uh, the numerical approximation comes in, is saying, oh, but that we approximate by a linear function. Then again, we integrate exactly. So in this numerical scheme, which is of this exponential operator type, where, for example, Lubich and Marie, uh, Marie's Hochbuch are experts, you exploit already in these weights. It's not a simple trapezoidal rule or midpoint rule, as in case of Frank Nicholson. You exploit that you have here this exponential protein. And these kind of shifts, Basically, the weights a little bit differently. Thank you. Other questions? Yes. Uh, yeah. In general, speaking, it's a bit 
Here it is Caputo because um, here you have the DT alpha in and you, you have it uh, in this side here. It's written as first the derivative and then the convolution. Here is Caputo. Um, yes and no, for riemann leoville you have to be a little bit more careful. It's not that starting point. Um, I did write it down here because this is so easy to read and to understand here. But the idea is absolutely the same, that you take the definition of the riemann leoville which was basically here, and then you approximate the kernel by the sum of exponentials. And then from that step, you work forward. Um, there's a difference between these two approximations because for Caputo, you need the differentiability, whereas for riemann leoville you don't need it. So the regularity assumption is of smaller, uh, smaller regularity in case of riemann leoville Therefore, most models these days, in particular, um, for that example we had here with the dilute polymers, that is a big mess because uh, that uh, makes the analysis very much harder. Here, that is really the riemann leoville a fractional derivative which is used here. And in many uh, references on early work on this uh, field, what you have is that you have on the left of that equation, uh, the Caputo um, fractional derivative, but for us, it is on the right inside this F, which is a nonlinear function because it comes in with the U, and then it is inside on the right, and this is riemann leoville here. But the idea of applying the definition and then in the definition, you replace the kernel by this discrete sum of exponential. That's the thing. Yeah. Um, yes, of course, I don't have a slide here with me, but um, here, if you think about what are alternative schemes, so the very popular, or also in the engineering literature, very popular one is one of these classic schemes, also known as L1 scheme, uh, which has many, uh, from the first starting point, has many more improvements about going to graded meshes with respect to time and so on and so on. And that we um, coded and compared and it has these rational approximation in our view has two main advantages. First of all, if you go really to 2D, 3D PDE approximations, memory consumption is much, much smaller. And while uh, some other prob uh, schemes have also a logarithmic growth with the number of extra costs, it seems, but this is no proof, it seems that the constant for our uh, number of modes is much smaller. So we can work with a small number of extra modes, and this is a smaller number than for many other schemes. Yeah. Thank you. I think uh, it's time for coffee. What do you think? <laughs> and to thank again Barbara for a nice talk. Well, I'll be at the second floor. It is possible to have a copy of this one, right? It's sure. Nice. Um, Do you have a USB stick or does anyone have a USB stick?